Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I wanted to uh, thank um, Dave and Charlize for inviting me here. I'm, I'm really excited to be talking about some of these issues, and I'm I'm really looking forward to sharing and learning over the next couple of days. Um, what I've been tasked with is really to just start the conversation around um, some of the LC issues that may be emerging from this space. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail since there's such a wealth of experience um, in the room, and I think we'll be diving deep uh, into some of the issues as the, as the days progress. Um, so I'm just going to give you kind of a, a teaser, if you will, um, of, of some of the issues that might arise. And, and I thought I would do it by focusing um, on the people, the humans, um, that are participating in these projects, some of their motivations, and also some of the dimensions of these projects that may be uh, invoking some of the, the, the ethical issues that we might want to focus in on. Um, just by way of introduction, so I'm Sandra Lee. I'm a medical anthropologist at the Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics. Uh, I've been working um, on a project looking at uh, personal genetic testing over the last several years at 23andMe. Uh, specifically interested in issues around social networking and how the genome um, can act as a conduit for different social identities and social formations, um, but also interested in their research efforts in terms of uh, uh, recruiting folks into um, their biobank and, and, and seeing the types of collaborations that have emerged from that. Um, so what I thought I would start with um, is, and I'm drawing upon a, a number of folks' work, which I, and I'll send you the, the references afterwards, but um, to start with why people are participating in this type of, uh, these type of projects. And um, the work of Bonnie et al. actually resonates with some of the things that I've, I've seen in, in, at 23andMe, um, just in terms of um, the different kinds of things like egoism, collectivism, altruism, and principalism. And I, I thought I'd just walk through some of this um, as a way of thinking about, about the different stakeholders. So um, egoism, uh, you know, you have the perspective of the scientists, uh, the data volunteers provide um, and enhance my, uh, my research. You have the volunteers. Um, who want to collaborate with scientists because it enables them to, to open their horizons to new ideas and knowledge. And so there's this idea that, that engaging in these projects can uh, provide something that each stakeholder wants from that endeavor. Um, collectivism, uh, this, this idea of collaboration with volunteers will be helpful for my scientific community. Uh, for the volunteers, um, this, the, these efforts, these collaborations between scientists um, and volunteers will be ben ben beneficial for the volunteers, perhaps also as a community. Um, altruism, the collaboration with volunteers helps educate them about scientific uh, methods. Um, I'm going to help uh, with science education through these various projects. Collaboration uh, for the volunteers, collaboration between scientists and scientific volunteers are beneficial for scientists. I'm doing this because I want to further science. Um, and then principalism, this idea that um, collaboration with volunteers is worth, uh, worthwhile because I believe that all scientific knowledge should be accessible to everyone regardless of their expertise. Um, from the perspective of the volunteers, um, there is this attitude that uh, similarly that there, wants, there, there needs to be uh, increased accessibility um, by the public to, uh, to scientific knowledge. So, so this, is, this is not new, obviously, but it helps us think about what might be the motivations and the desires, the hopes of the various stakeholders who are involved in these citizen science projects. Um, there's been some work, and, and we heard a little bit from Pietro in terms of how these relationships then are structured in various projects. Um, Dana Rotman and her group have thought about it in these three ways. I think there are probably other ways as well. But if we think about these sci sci citizen science projects as, as being contributory um, projects, what does that mean with regard to the relationship between researchers and the public? Um, here, uh, the way she's defined it, the public are recruited into projects that are already conceived and designed by scientists, so uh, perhaps science per usual, but the idea that they are uh, brought into these projects, collaborative projects, 
Scientists work with the public to collaborate on research design in addition to enabling the public to contribute data. So uh, there might be some uh, collaboration on actually coming up with the design together. And then these co-created projects. So scientists and the public are involved in each phase of research, beginning from the conception all the way through to co-publication. Um, so this, this is one way of thinking about it, but I think it, it's helpful to start to, um, as we move into these various uh, citizen science projects, to think about what are our taxonomies with regard to those relationships, and then how do those relationships then create uh, expectations around reciprocity and benefit sharing, and um, also uh, responsibility with regard to expertise. Um, it, it helps us to try to structure um, what is happening um, for these various categories. Um, so what I thought I would do now is just to go through um, some dimensions of these projects and uh, to think about what are the kinds of questions that might emerge. And this is not to be exhaustive, um, but it's just, it's just to give us a sense of um, what are the kinds of qualities that uh, we can pick up from these different citizen science projects, and how does, how does the public think about what they're getting out of it. Um, and I'm relying on the work of uh, Christopher Kelty and um, Aaron Panofsky, who are uh, fellow social scientists, who, who, who looked at participant-based research and came up with these different seven dimensions. And um, I thought that would be useful um, to help us to, to go through some of these. Um, so the first is uh, this idea of an educative dividend, or the idea of self-discovery. So participants um, eager to, uh, to join a project where they can learn something new about themselves or learn a new skill. And here, um, iWire, Sebastian Sung's project, which Pietro uh, mentioned, is an example of this, where um, they're able to, um, to play a game, but they're also able to learn a bit about the brain and their and neuro neuronal mapping. Um, and it begs the question, um, you know, who is able to participate? Um, what level of expertise? I mean, presumably, this is open to the general public. Um, we might want to ask what part of the public um, is actually being taken up into these projects. What are the, the expectations around expertise? Um, who, who curates the data? Um, what is the nature of quality control? How are standards created? Are these created by the participants? Um, or are these uh, simply uh, research-defined standards? And then how, do, how are these monitored? What are the limits for repurposing and mining shared data in the name of discovery? So, and this speaks more to um, the, the uh, let's say, the efforts of 23andMe, where um, data is collected and then perhaps mined. Um, do participants who agree to have um, their data uh, uh, contributed for the, the broad purpose of health research, then also are they, are they agreeing to, to, you, to have that data mined in very different ways um, in the name of discovery. Um, another dimension of these various projects are the goals and tasks, um, where participants not only undertake tasks but help set the goals. Um, and, you know, here I think this is an exemplar of PXE International in terms of defining um, what those goals might be by the, by the participants. Um, questions about how are goals determined in various projects? Who sets the agenda? Who participates in research design? Uh, who determines what the results mean? Um, how are results published? And what constitutes acknowledgement and responsibility? So how far do projects then take this idea of participants being kind of co-creators of the research and what types of structures might need to be in place in terms of um, uh, executing on those, on those goals? Um, another dimension is this idea of research control. So participants get to control or use the resources, not merely produce them. This is uh, Makuto, um, a, an online digital archive, if you will, where uh, cultural heritage uh, products and um, resources may be deposited and shared with individuals. Um, but the idea here is that there are working rules around who gets access to these resources, how they should be used. Um, and so it begs the question, when you enter into projects where there are pooled resources, um, are institutional interests always apparent um, or, uh, in terms of um, these various projects? How does the ethos of open sharing impact the desire for control? 
um, how do participants try to manage this? How, how do researchers uh, negotiate this with their participants? How is data protected and secured? What rights do third-party platforms have to resources? Um, then there's the exit. So this dimension of uh, wanting the ability to leave without penalty and with the resources that they've accumulated from their participation in the past. So is exiting even possible for uh, citizen science projects and biomedical research? Uh, what assurance can be made that one has actually exited? Uh, how do you know that you've uh, left the party, if you will? Um, how to exit without some loss of data, access to network, and other resources? Um, should there, is it, a, is, a, is it all or nothing? Um, should people who have participated in various projects uh, be offered something for their participation, some access, um, or is it simply a, a full-on exit, if that is even technically possible? Um, voice. So this dimension of having voice in these various projects, the opportunity to speak back in order to influence the use of data. Um, participants want to have voice. What are the rules of engagement? What are effective models for speaking back? Um, what is the obligation to hear those uh, voices who perhaps want to change a particular research agenda or the rules of engagement? Um, whose voices are actually being heard in these projects? We think about the public being taken up in these citizen science projects. Um, you know, is there research to suggest that maybe it's a very select part of the public? Um, I would venture to say, judging from at least direct-to-consumer genetics, um, it is a very a particular slice of the public. What does that mean in terms of the diversity and representativeness of participants? And if we are going to include these in biomedical research, how do we be mindful of those kinds of, of uh, characteristics um, in terms of voice? Um, another dimension um, that, that has become um, exceedingly popular is this idea of gaming and having visible metrics. So participants are really interested to see how, how they're progressing in whatever uh, project they're involved with. So these empirical demonstrations of connection between participants and outcomes. Um, and I guess the question um, here that Pietro actually uh, brought up is this idea of compensation for participation. So is entertainment and kind of the, the, the de desire to participate in a game, is that compensation enough? Um, are there issues with blurring work and play? Um, not calling it play and not work when it's actually valuable labor to researchers. Um, what happens with that blurring of language in which it's, uh, which a, citizen science project might be characterized to would be participants. Should we care whether it is a corporate entity or a nonprofit uh, sponsoring uh, these games? Um, how do we think through some of these issues about profit? Um, and then finally, this dimension, effective, visible, communicative capacity is how Kelty and Panofsky have characterized it. But this is um, the desire for participants to have opportunities to produce affect, affiliation, sociability, and, and this really resonates with um, the work um, that I've been doing with 23andMe in terms of um, the desire for participants to be connected to other individuals um, makes the, their activities more meaningful. And so the kinds of questions that we were asking is, uh, what are the expectations in the flow of information uh, when you think that you are part of a, an insular community and you are more free and trusting to, show, to, to share information? Um, how, how does the participant understand how the flow of information will occur? What should participants know about the limits of privacy and data security? Um, should there be oversight of dissemination of expertise and self-research activities? So. Um, so thinking about uh, what these uh, social platforms um, uh, create in terms of different questions around LC. Um, and then I'll just end with this. Um, you know, one of the goals for myself in coming to this workshop is really trying to figure out, so what's new here? Um, we've, we've referred to these type of activities um, in different ways. Um, and I think it does make a difference if we're calling this citizen science versus uh, community-based participatory research or hacking, biohacking. So I, I think that um, thinking about, uh, you know, how we want to um,
think about this in terms of is this really democratization where you're you're creating new ways in which the public can actually have a say or have a have a role in science or is this science per usual just broader uh, in terms of recruitment and and labor uh, is it bottom up disruption um, is that where the governance models are really going to be coming from or is this really a mode, another mode of institutionalization um, how do we know the difference uh, with these various projects? Um, is open sharing and transparency uh, occurring or is this um, kind of situational in the sense that we have this constant evolving in terms of, in terms of the, the rules for engagement and how do participants react to that type of landscape? Um, is this empowerment or is this a lot of data without real information? Um, so these are just just to be provocative and thinking about what is citizen science? Is it really different? What are the kinds of social processes that it puts in place that we haven't seen yet? And if they are truly new, um, what are the new ethical issues that we should be thinking about? And I'll just end there. And um, I think Kelly's going to help us with um, a discussion um, of some of these issues. And here are just some of the references that I've used in this, in this talk. Thank you. You've heard a lot from the previous two speakers and I think from your morning conversation. So, and I am especially motivated to have us break on time because the coffee is upstairs. It's not in this room. Um, so we have 10 minutes to kind of do an initial synthesis and gelling on what you've just heard. And we know that this is just gonna be a start. So what I wanna invite you to do is take, literally take, um, two minutes, and just for yourself, you just heard a lot. What are, what are the new, are there new LC issues here that citizen science poses to us? Are there, are there some, some old ones that are, we don't wanna throw out, that are, are really important for us to keep on the table as we're working in this newer space? So take, Two minutes, and for the, there's a, a really nice active uh, Twitter feed going right now. For those that are watching uh, remotely, I, I would love to see your LC questions, tag your LC issues as you're thinking about them uh, just showing up on the Twitter feed, and I'll try to, try to read those out as we, as we head into summary here. <laughs> 